morning, everyone. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm one minute late. I got sidetracked. Sometimes you get sidetracked and you don't keep track of the time. It's tough when that happens. Uh, we have a different coffee cup today for those who um, are very, very aware. I was drinking coffee this morning and James decided to jump, dump all of his beans into my coffee cup. So today we're using these coffee cups. These are Amy's coffee cups. I only have one coffee cup myself. These are cute though, right? They're cute. All right. We had a question sent in that was, you know, interestingly enough, this is something I don't really talk about a whole lot, but like, what do you, how do you play against people who are just atrociously terrible? <laughs> um, so the question today was, how do you play against players who are very, very passive? These are players who essentially never raise, they never re-raise, they limp, they call everything. And that's it. Where's Mr. James? just ran by the door. He's uh, losing his mind, he doesn't sleep anymore. I was actually gonna discuss today how to deal with um, relapses whenever you are you have issues and you fall back into them, but I don't know the answer to that because James has yet to sleep through the night for a week. So we'll talk about something different, something I actually know how to do. Okay, so how do you play against very passive players? First things first, we are going to be discussing specifically players who generally limp and call everything. They just don't raise. Clearly, this is a bad strategy, but that's what apparently some people do, especially in small stakes games. Okay, so say they do limp and they limp call everything. First question, just or first uh, concept, just because someone is passive does not mean that they are tight or loose. This is not even exact science, but there's sort of a spectrum, right? You can either be aggressive or passive. You know the difference between that, right? Passive means doing a lot of checking and calling. Aggressive means doing a lot of betting and re-raising. Then there's also looseness or tightness. Loose means you play lots and lots of hands. Tight means you play very few hands. The question was, how do you play against loose? Well, how do you play against passive players, right? So. Right off the bat, that, quest that question is not specific because is, are we talking about players who are very loose and passive, meaning they have wide ranges, or players who are very tight and passive, meaning they only have the nuts, right? So those are two very different types of players, and it's important you differentiate between those two types of players because they are very, very different. Um, so, like, what say they limp and call with everything. What is everything? Is everything tens and better in ace-king? Well, against that player, you just don't put a chip in the pot, right? But if everything is 80% of hands, because they're very, very loose, then that may be a little bit different. Hey, James. James, come here. James, come here. James, come here. You want to say hi? Come say hi to everybody. Hi, James. Oh, so you say hi, James? You say hi, James. Wait, hello. It's Daddy. That's Daddy over there, yeah. Daddy. And Daddy's here, yeah. Daddy. And James. Um... James is going out to one of his friends' house. He's going to John's house. Not me, a different John. You know my name is Jonathan? My name is Daddy. My name is Daddy. My Daddy. Yeah, Daddy. Can you say bye-bye to everyone and go to, go to John's house? Bye. 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 Oh, you, oh, you wait. You all may not know this, but there are three images here of James. And he's like, bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, bye. Can you blow a kiss? Have a good have a good time with John's house. See ya. The house. See you. The house. Bye. Bye. Yeah, go to John's house. Okay. So first things first, is the range loose or tight? Right. Let's discuss the tight player. This is the easy one because the tight player is just always going to have a very good hand. If the player is tight, they limp and then they call with only not the nuts. Don't try to bluff this guy. Don't try to you know, push him off of an overpair or something like that. Against these players, you simply want to, you know, raise, well, first off, if you know they're tight, you just don't even raise them, just limp behind with all of your hands that have good implied odds, and then go from there. That said, this player doesn't exist that often because it's uh, such a horrible strategy. It's really only a good strategy against players who are just mindlessly aggressive and those don't exist so much either, at least today. Most people figured out you can't beat bonkers. All right, next. Um, what about the player who is very loose and passive. These are where you're gonna make a lot of money because the worst thing that someone can do to you, 
whenever you're playing poker, is for them to raise you or to re-raise you. What happens is these players let you realize your equity in every scenario because you know whenever you they limp and you raise, they're not going to re-raise you. They're just going to limp and then call, and that lets you see the flop with everything. Imagine you they limp, you raise with whatever, 9-7 offsuit, and then they re-raise you. Well, now you have some equity in this pot, right? Say they have ace-queen and you have 35 or 40% equity, and you have position, but you have to fold because they just limp re-raised you, well, that's pretty bad. But if they limp and then call with their ace-queen, that's fantastic because you get to see the flop. So against these players, you get to raise with all sorts of stuff in position. Now, it's very important to realize that people can be very loose, or sorry, very passive pre-flop, but also very aggressive after the flop. Quite often, the players who are very tight pre-flop don't fold very often after the flop because their range is very strong, right? If they have tens or better and ace-king, then why would they be folding after the flop? It doesn't make sense, right? Um, typically, as they're tighter pre-flop, they don't fold as much after the flop. As they're looser pre-flop, they will fold by the river. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to fold on the flop. A lot of the players who are very loose call a lot of flop bats because they have a gut shot or whatever and they want to see the turn. But a lot of these players will fold by the river. So against these loose, passive players, if they are also sort of calling stationy on the flop and the turn, usually you need to be betting the flop, betting the turn, and betting the river, and that's going to make them fold almost everything by the river. Now, some of these players are just extreme calling stations, and they never fold. And if they never fold, then value bet relentlessly, right? If they're going to be calling you down with ace high or king high or bottom pair, hands like middle pair are pretty great, right? Middle pair is pretty good if your opponent's going to be calling you down with ace high and king high. So if someone is very loose, they don't, re they don't raise you, you really can raise a lot. Um, very often you do want to be raising these players a lot because if you raise, you're going to force people yet to act behind you to fold. The one time you want to be limping behind is when you're specifically on the button. If you're on the button, you are closing the action and you don't have to worry about anybody else being in position against you. Whereas if, say, early position limps, you know he has a loose range, and you raise from middle position, now the button's going to fold a lot of the time, the cutoff's going to fold, and hijack's going to fold, and now you have position. So you want to be more inclined to raise limpers when you are farther away from the button. So keep that in mind. Um, usually you don't want to be doing a whole lot of raising of limpers from out of position unless they're going to fold preflop, but again, these players don't fold preflop, right? Since they don't fold preflop, um, you would rather keep the pots manageable when you are out of position, just because you want to play small pots from out of position in general. Um, if you do have a significant advantage, though, like say you have queens or ace-jack or something like that, like a pretty good hand, you want to be raising in that scenario because then they're going to call you with all sorts of very dominated hands. So you want to be raising primarily a very linear range for value. You always want to ask yourself, what do my opponents do wrong and what can I do to take advantage of that, right? Really, those two questions will be very, very beneficial. Also, what could possibly happen that is very, very bad for me? If something's very, very bad for you, then you want to avoid that. Like, you don't want to be, well, if someone's just loose and passive. It can't, it just can't go that bad for you. But an easy way for it to go bad for you, say someone limps from middle position, you're in the big blind with 9-7 offsuit. You don't want to raise 9-7 offsuit they're going to call you every time, right? That's going to be bad for you, especially if they play somewhat well after the flop. Because you're going to end up with nothing after the flop a lot of the time, and they're going to have, obviously, a hand better than 9-7 offsuit. So... Again, scenarios like that, you don't want to be raising. But if you have ace-jack, then you know they're, they're going to be calling you with 10-9 with suited and stuff like that that you're in pretty decent shape against. Um, let's see. I wrote down some notes today, and I can't read my notes. Basically, against people who have wide ranges who will fold it by the river, you want to be using a very aggressive strategy. Against players with very tight ranges, who will not fold very often by the river, you want to be using a very snug strategy yourself. Um, against those players, by the way, who do limp with like only very good hands, you can limp behind with all sorts of hands with implied odds. Like Even king x suit is okay. You don't want to be limping queen 4 suit or something like that, but king 5 suit is fine, king 2 suit is probably okay. Assuming the players yet to act are not going to be raising very often. Now, the problem with limping behind, like say early position limps and you limp behind with king nine suited. If someone yet to act is going to raise often, 
that's not good. So you would, in that scenario, you'd rather raise yourself. You don't want to limp and then have someone make it eight big blinds and position against you. That's very bad. So you'd rather either fold or raise yourself if that's going to result in it getting heads up. Augustine says, if you raise with ace jack and all the table calls, what do we do? Well, so first off, that's not what we're discussing at all. We've only been discussing heads up scenarios, right? Always make sure you're discussing very specific scenarios because there are really only like 500 scenarios that can come up. So imagine in this scenario, someone limps early position. We raise with ace jack in the middle position and then seven people call or four people call. Well, now we just play very straightforwardly. As the pot becomes very multi-way, you want to play more and more straightforwardly because it's too likely someone has something after the flop. Um, and if you're against weak passive players, it becomes ace, nine, seven, and they check to you and you bet and someone raises, you probably need to just fold. It's a hard thing to do for a lot of people, but most people are loose and are loose but passive or tight but passive. So when they are aggressive, it means either they have a very good draw, there really aren't very many good draws on ace, what I say, ace, nine, seven, only 10 eights is a good draw and they may not even have that in their range. And then, val good value hands. What is a good value hand on ace, nine, seven? Well, if they're gonna raise an ace, two offsuit, then yes, clearly you should call. But most people are gonna be raising only ace, queen, and better. So how does ace, jack do against ace, queen, and better? Pretty poorly, right? So, that's the general strategy you wanna be using in that situation. Um, if you do see you're getting lots and lots of callers, you want to raise a uh, raise just straight up for value. That's gonna be your best big suited hands and big pairs. That's usually gonna be the best way to go about it. Um, Uh-oh, we close Instagram. Bring Instagram back. Sorry, Instagram, we're back. All right, how do you play small pocket pairs with limps with around 40 big blinds? Just limp, limp and see the flop. Again, juggernaut, always ask, how could this go poorly for me? Imagine it goes limp, 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 you have pocket sixes on the button. If you raise to seven big blinds and someone jams you, that's horrible, right? Where if it goes limp, 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 you limp, you see the flop, you miss, you fold, you lose one big blind, it's not a big deal. So understand that. What are your thoughts on buying Poker Snowy for newbies? I think it's probably a decent idea. It's a good way to practice against strong opponents and um, it's gonna be pretty good for you. Is this topic on cash games or tournaments or both? Both cash games and tournaments are not that different. There are only really a few differences. The main differences are in cash games, you should be more inclined to value bet in big pots and bluff in big pots because stack converts conservation is irrelevant. Um, there's rake and cash game hands, so that should often lead you to playing a little bit tighter, but that's it. But don't, don't think cash games and tournaments are all that different. I think a lot of people want to think that these games are drastically different. And when you're playing deep stack, they're just not. Um, shallow stack, they are, so they do start to become pretty different because with 20 big blind stacks and cash games, you just need to be ramming it in a lot. But in tournaments, you need to be a little bit more conservative. You have a local tournament coming up. I said something about bounty tournaments not being great ideas to play. I mean, they're fine to play. It doesn't really matter. But realize that in a bounty tournament, what happens? What are the payouts? The payouts are very flat, right? If you bust anybody, you get some money back. That means all that money is coming out of first place and second place and third place in general, if it was to be compared to a regular tournament, which essentially means it's a very flat structure. Pros want very steep structures. If you're a pro, in the ideal world, you would want winner-take-all tournaments. Because if you're a pro, you're going to win the tournament more often than other players, right? You don't want 20th, 28th place to get some money because you're not going to take 28th place as often as other players. You're going to be taking first, second, and third more often. All right, if you raise from middle position seven big blinds and get a bunch of callers, should you tighten up your raising range or up your bet size? Um, listen, first off, if you raise something like Ace Jack and get six callers, it's not bad. I think a lot of people think it's a bad thing. Um, in reality, what's happening is you're putting in money preflop with... Let's say there are five players, right? Five players total. You need to have 20% equity to break even. You probably have like 24% equity against all the ranges. So you're putting in one-fifth of the money, but you're going to get back one-fourth of the money on average. That's not bad. That's a fine result. Don't think your goal is to get it heads up or something like that. Because what happens is whenever you try to get it heads up, unless your opponent search is awful, what's going to happen is say you make it 15 big blinds. If someone calls you, now all of a sudden their range has ace jack in bad shape, which is not good. So it's not such a big deal to have multiple players as long as you play well after the flop. The problem is, is that a lot of players who raise with ace jack and they get six callers and it comes ace nine seven, they bet someone raises, they go all in and then they call and they get shown ace nine and then they're out or they lose, right? You have to learn to play well after the flop and get away from marginal made hands. So don't raise small and medium pairs like eights and sixes. Is it better to limp behind and basically set mine? Yes, whenever you're playing very multi-way and you're playing like 40 big lines deep, you don't want to raise because in that scenario, if everybody calls you, 
again, say it's five ways, you're probably going to have right at 20% equity. You're not, you don't really have a ton of pre-flop equity in those spots. Your value is going to come from putting in one big blind, making a set, and then stacking someone for 40. You don't need to be blasting it with small, medium pairs until you can get it all in. If you can get it all in, then that becomes a little bit better, right? Like say it goes limp, 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 and you have 20 big blinds, now you can jam, and if someone calls you, you're probably 50-ish, 50%-ish, well, actually, you'd be like 45%-ish. And if um, they all fold, that's great. So it's a little bit different. You're an aggressive player. Once in a while, a passive player will trap you and trick you. How do you avoid this? Realize who is trapping you and tricking you. Pay attention, right? I mean, this is the one big downside of being loose and aggressive is that if you're like really blasting and trying to win every single pot, inevitably, someone's going to just limp and call, limp and call, limp and call. I mean... I discussed this in my very first tournament book, Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker Volume 1. If someone is a maniac, raise preflop, make your regular continuation bet, then check call turn, check call river. They're going to bluff the turn and they're going to bluff the river and you're going to stack them over and over and over again. If I was just starting my poker coaching career, or my, sorry, my poker career, how would I approach building a bankroll without having to commit the same time and volume as when I was single? That's a, nice, that's a nasty question because you need to put in lots and lots of time. <laughs> Um, if you're trying to build your money from nothing, you have to understand you make money when you buy in, right? If you're not buying in very often, you're not going to make very much money. So in theory, you want to play games where you have a gigantic return on investments. Which games give you the biggest return on investment? Very soft cash games or very soft tournaments. That's going to be your answer. You don't want to sit there and grind sit and goes all day like I did because you're going to have tiny ROIs. I was happy having a tiny ROI because I had lots and lots of time. I could sit there, I could play 12 hours a day every day, and it was fine. And it did for three years, and I turned fifty dollars into three hundred fifty k. That's not for everyone, though. They don't want to sit there and play twelve hours a day every day to make hundred k a year. Um, but me, as a young college kid with no skills, it was great. So, what should you do? You have to understand: if you don't put in very much volume, though, your variance is going to be through the roof. Volume cures variance. At the end of the day, if you play lots and lots of hands, even with a tiny win rate, you will win. I mean, look at a lot of cash game players. They have small win rates sometimes in high stakes games, yet their graph just goes slowly straight up. It's beautiful. If you play tournaments with a high win rate, you'll see your graph usually goes down, 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 then up when you win something. Down, 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 then up. Sometimes it goes down for a long time. And then maybe whenever you finally do get a good score, it's not enough to make up for all your losses just purely because of variance. So understand that this question is not, it's, it's a rough one to answer because I don't think there's a good answer. You cannot put in volume. You should not expect to be able to build a bankroll consistently. Justin, that'd be a good sound clip. All right, let's see. It's fun watching the old school tournaments. It definitely is. Tournaments for winner take all is a field with strength down to very few players. They would. The game would become way more skill intensive, just like chess, and no one would play for significant money. That's the problem with games where that are very skill intensive. They inevitably die. Look at seven card stud. Seven Card Stud used to be one of those popular hold'em games, or one, well, not, not hold'em games, one of those popular games in poker. Because, well, people didn't know any better, but people quickly realized that the good players win way too often in Seven Card Stud. So what happens? The game dies. Look around the poker room now. There's like one Seven Card Stud table, and it's all older players, because that's just what they play. Um, Sure, you can add it as part of a mixed game, which you know, a lot of good players try to do because it, then you have a nice skill-intensive game in the format. But you slowly see poker moving towards more and more luck-based games. You see um, Pot Limit Omaha, right? It's way more variance in Pot Limit Omaha than No Limit Hold'em. You see Short Deck Hold'em. Same thing. Way, way, way more variance. And that's good for bad players. And good players realize you want to play a game that's good for bad players because... They're going to win sometimes. If they win sometimes, they'll keep coming back. Would you rather be able to win 55% of sessions and have a game that lasts forever or 70% of sessions and, you know, the game dies after a few years? That's really what, what, you're, what you're asked a lot of the time. Uh, let's see. I'm reading chat, sorry. When you play poker, snow, it's said to three bet king jack suited against, and the big blind gets under the gun raise. You know you don't recommend the three bet under the gun raise. First off, poker snowy often deals six handed. That's a bit different. Um, also, its ranges are just probably more balanced. The king jack suited may become a bluff, but yes, I would typically call there. You have to understand, poker snowy assumes you're playing against a perfect computer, 
or close to perfect computer and you're not, right? You're playing against regular humans. If people play pass passively with the nest and garbage, there's a lot more garbage. That's true, unless they're tight preflop. If they're tight preflop, they have way more nuts than garbage, right? We discussed this right at the beginning of this stream. If people limp with only nines and better than ace king, well, that's a really strong range you can't do a whole lot about, right? Thank you for doing this live program. You're very welcome. We're here Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern time. My nose is messing up, everyone. I apologize. <laughs> Don't know what's going on. All right. What's the difference between secret special tournament poker and mastering small stakes and element hold'em? Do you need both? They are different. Mastering small stakes and element hold'em is pretty much entirely about learning how to assess hand ranges and how to develop a balanced strategy and then how to adjust it against the weaker opponents you're going to encounter. Uh, Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker is pretty much an, a complete guide to beating tournaments, specifically, right? So they are different books. One does a lot of range analysis. The other one does more of, I'm not going to say general advice, but more specific advice for specific scenario, scenarios, but it doesn't go deep on how to develop fundamentally sound ranges because, you know, honestly, the book is eight years old now and nobody knew how to develop fundamentally sound ranges back then. Um, I'm actually going back and updating that book. Slowly but surely. And it turns out, almost everything I said back then was pretty close to what the solvers tell you to do today. So that's lucky. We, we'd already figured it out, but we didn't know we figured it out. Back then when I wrote the book, I did not have a good framework in place. I knew roughly what to do, but I did not know why I was doing it. And, eight years later, when I wrote Mastering Small Stakes and Element Hold'em, now I know why we do what we do. And that's exactly what I teach over at PokerCoaching.com. If you have not signed up for that, go do that. If you're not in the inner circle, Look into that. We're having a two-hour, I'm sorry, it's, they used to two hours, now they're like four hours, question and answer call where people call in and ask me their poker questions live. We're going to do that today at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And we do that every two weeks. So you can find that at pokercoaching.com slash inner circle. Today's topic is fear. How to get over the fear of doing lots of things in poker. Fearing that they have the better hand. Fearing that uh, your play will, will fail. Fearing that you will go broke, et cetera, et cetera. So that's our topic for today. Um, anyway, you find yourself taking fourth or fifth in your tournament a lot. Um, well, that, that could be a problem. You want to be taking first, second, and third a lot. Let's see. You usually keep a bankroll of 1 to 4K online, $15 average buy in. When you play rebuys, you rebuy less, should you rebuy less than 40 big blinds? Um, probably. Depends on if you have a positive ROI, right? Whenever you're in a re entry tournament, you want to ask yourself, would I re-enter this tournament again if this was a new tournament? So would you buy into a tournament with 20 big blinds and um, that's it, right? Would you buy in for 20 big blinds in this tournament? You're gonna have a tiny ROI. Would you, are you happy playing tournaments with a tiny ROI? Volume cures variance, that is true. Why is variance higher in short deck no limit hold'em? Because range equities run closer. If you look at short deck no limit hold'em, you'll see that like Ace's preflop against Jack-10 suited is somewhere close to 50-50. And no limit hold'em, it's not anywhere close to 50-50, right? So that means ranges run, or hand values run closer, just like in Palom and Omaha, right? You see Ace-Ace-X-X against 9 8 7 6, it's like 50-50. And as there are more 50-50 spots, variance goes through the roof. John cures bad play. <laughs> I do my best. How can you manage your bell curve? I don't know what your bell curve is. Are you referring to your standard deviation? You don't necessarily need to manage your standard deviation. It's not that big of a deal. You're in the gym on the bike watching this. Awesome. Could you make $15 an hour playing 1-1 one, one cash games? Almost certainly. When's my next tournament? I'm going to Vegas in May for the World Poker Tour Tournament of Champions and the ARIA World Poker Tour events. I just had a baby, for those who don't know. And it does not seem responsible to leave my wife at home with a one-month-old baby. There's a tournament in Borgata a few days ago. Wish I could have gone, but we have the baby. It's a tournament in Montreal right now. Wish I could have gone, but I had the baby. Um, I'm happy to stay home. It's important to have priorities in life, and I purposefully developed my life so that I knew I could have a family. About four or five years ago, I started realizing I needed to have some kids. And um, in order to have kids, I wanted to be able to stay at home a lot. And here we are, we're doing it, we're staying home. Thank you to all of you for being here, watching this, signing up to PokerCoaching.com, buying my books. You let me stay home and live the life of my dreams, so thank you very much. 
You're still confused about blockers. Read Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. Um, we're not going to get into blockers, but you know what? We'll talk about blockers in a future episode. Because they are important. Something else we didn't know anything about a long time ago was blockers. We knew they were kind of important. We didn't know exactly how important. What percentage of your cast game chess should you expect to win? Depends on if you're good or bad, lucky guy. If you'd rely on getting lucky, probably not a lot. Um, also, <clears throat> that's not a very good question because I know that whenever I used to play cash games, I would play eight or ten hours a day at Bellagio every day, and I would win only about half of my sessions. People say, how do you make any money? Well, usually my winning sessions were about two or three times the size of my losing sessions. So you can do the math, right? Winning days were like plus 5K. Losing days were like minus 2,500. Run that over and over and over again, you make a bunch of money. Um, most people who play relatively short sessions, I, actually, I don't know. It depends a lot on your general strategy and how you are approaching the games. But the idea of I need to win X amount of my sessions is kind of asinine. A better question is, what is my win rate per hand or per hour or something like that? Per um, number of hands is ideal. That's how online players measure it. Because, I mean, imagine you play a one-hand session over and over again. You're like, well, I guess in theory, you're going to lose a lot of your hands, right? If you have to put in an ante or something. Um, but in, in general, set, winning sessions is irrelevant. What matters is winning money long-term. What well, non-premium hands are good to three bet? Check out Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash mastering. It explains all of that. You're taking off to work to play the Big 50, I guess at the World Series of Poker, and you can't find out when day two is. Yeah, well, Paul or Mark Levin has the link for you. There you go. Thank you. Is there a player you are most displeased with to be sitting at your table? No, I don't really care. Congrats on the new kid. Thank you. Any live meetups during the World Series? I will be there during the main event for sure, probably about a four or five days before the main event. So check that out. Any books on live turbo tournaments? Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker Volume 1. The structure of the tournament does not significantly change how you should play any individual hand. You just need to learn how to play all the various stack sizes. This was a big leak in your game, trying to win a big percentage of sessions. You were hurting your ROI. Yeah, I mean, imagine... It's not hard to win every session, or almost every session. I mean, imagine you get, uh, if you just go all in every hand, right? I guess, let's say you're going to play 10 hands, you go all in every single hand. You're going to win 10 blinds a ton. But whenever you lose, you're going to lose 100 big blinds or 200 big blinds. But you're going to win like 95% of sessions. So is that the goal, to win 95% of sessions would be down a lot of money? It is for some players. Um, if I do do a live meetup, actually I will do a live meetup. We'll I'll buy breakfast for everyone like I do every year. Um... We will send an email out about that. So make sure you're on my email list. Do I sometimes do live coaching? I do coaching through Skype. On the Inner Circle, do we have a replay for those who can't watch it live? Absolutely. All the Inner Circle members are encouraged to email in hands. And, you know, I understand people have jobs, people have lives, and they can't be in every Inner Circle webinar live. So I say email in your hands, and I will go through all of them. Usually 30 or 45 minutes are just spent going through questions of a few people who could not be there live. And, and some people are never there live just because it doesn't work for their schedule, but they like being able to send in their questions and have me answer them. What tables do I like the most? High above the belt so the camera can fit? Or, I mean, I don't really care that much. I don't like the big, thick ones. Like, I don't like it when there's a camera in the rail because it makes the rail very far from the felt, which in theory makes it easier for people to see your cards if they're looking. Um, ideally, you want almost no rail, because then your hands are closer, are flatter on the table and you, you nobody can see your cards. But if you have to go like this, well, clearly there's a lot of room where people could conceivably see your cards. I'm very paranoid about that. Made a deep run yesterday in the hot 22, thanks to PokerCoaching.com. <laughs> Since joining, your ROI has exploded. Good. That's exactly what we're going for, Louis Philippe. We're trying to help you out. I'm glad to hear that you are doing it. Top of the morning to me. I don't know when the top of the morning is. Maybe it's 9.30 a.m., I'm not sure. But I've been awake since uh, 5 a.m. today because Mr. James doesn't sleep. If it's free bre breakfast, you may book your flight. Listen, I've been trying to do this recently. Um, in Montreal, recently, we bought breakfast. Louis Philippe was there. We had, I don't know, eight or ten people who showed up. And we sat around. We talked poker. Mike Sexton showed up. He told us some stories. It was a lot of fun. And it was great. And we're, we do that in uh, most of the places where I go to play live tournaments. I've just decided I'm going to do it one day. 
If nobody shows up, that's fine. I'll leave by myself. And if some people show up, it'll be great. Where's Mr. James? He's at one of his friends' house named John. You'll buy me coffee at the World Series of Poker. <laughs> Something else I did one day, I quickly learned this was a bad idea. This was three or four years ago. Um, I was at Starbucks and I just posted on Instagram or Twitter or whatever. I said, I'm going to be at Starbucks from whatever, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Come by. And like 40 people came by. <laughs> so that was clearly a mistake. So now what we do is we uh, book breakfast. We book breakfast at the cafe next to it. Um, last time I think we had, well, about 40 people show up and we bought 40 people breakfast. It was not cheap, but it was a lot of fun. Really trying to step it up this year so you can join us. Good, step it up. Let's do it. I'm going to the World Series for the first time this year. What advice would I give? Figure out your priorities. What is your goal? And don't say your goal is to win a bracelet. What is your goal? Are you going to play one or two tournaments? Are you going to play for a week? Are you going to play for two months? Are you trying to make sure you leave Vegas with more money than you came with? Or are you happy to have a variance? This is a question I ask my dad every year. He comes out for a week or two. And I ask, are you fine losing the money you have, or do you want to make sure you go back with some money? And he always says he wants the high variance route. But imagine you go out there with like 5K, it's all of your money. Obviously, you don't want to lose 5K. So you should play a lot of smaller field size, side events instead of World Series of Poker events, because those are huge, and that means you're going to have huge variance. So if your goal is to take like 5K out there for a week and not lose it all, you probably shouldn't play a single World Series of Poker event. You should be playing at the smaller places to get 100 or 200 people in their feet in their fields, and you're going to probably do what well, you are going to have a way better chance to, to get money. Um, if your goal is to win a World Series of poker bracelet because that's all you care about, then obviously only play World Series of poker events, right? Don't even spend any time playing the other games. Where's my favorite place to play? I don't really care as long as it's nice. I like um, Aria; it's very nice. I like Bellagio. I've definitely played the most at Bellagio, that's for sure. Any tips to relax and not get caught up in the tournaments? I don't know. Go read my blog, jonathanlillipoker.com. I've written a bunch about this, so go check it out. Do we still do the home game on Stars? Um, I, we still run it. I have not played it in quite a while, but we still do run it. You can still win prizes every single week. jonathanlillipoker.com slash home game. Do you have to pay to have breakfast with me? No, it's free. Well, it's not free for me. It's free for you. <laughs> it cost me $1,000 or something like that, but it's free for me. Have you ever had a problem being excited, or have you had a problem sleeping due to being excited about poker? I mean, not really. Not like some people. You feel like other players are good and are messing with you. What should you do if they act, first of all, are they actually messing with you? Probably they're not. And then second, what should you do about it? Just play stronger ranges. At any point in my career, I sacrifice EV to decrease variance. Yeah, I mean, one thing I did probably very wrong is whenever um, Party Poker opened, went from uh, the biggest no-limit game being $2, $4 no-limit to $25, $50 no-limit pretty much overnight. And I was playing at this time $500,000, $2,000 dollars sit and goes with a decent ROI. I was printing equity, twenty dollars or $30,000 a month every week. No problem. I'm sorry, every month, no problem. Um, and then I actually saw my ROI increase. Why? Because all the good players decided to take their shot at $25, $50. Like uh, Dave Benefield, uh, Phil Galfond, players like Andrew Robel, those three players, they used to be regulars in all my games. They decided, we're going to try cash games. They moved to cash games. They crushed it. They eventually got to play super high stakes, and then they won all the money. While I sat there, instead of winning $20,000 a month, I started winning $40,000 a month. I was thrilled. Then I eventually realized from talking to them, they're making like $100K a month. <laughs> so they, the variance was going to be much higher, but the payoff was potentially bigger. So I was slow to get on that boat. I didn't even realize I was slow to get on that boat. That was just um, me wanting uh, consistent win rates, right? I did, not, I did not like the idea of me going from potentially making 40K a month or 20K a month to losing. Who knows? I may not even be good at cash games, right? I could lose 100K a month. I didn't want that. But eventually I did move to that, to uh, the 2550 games, and I won like 100K in the first month. And then Party Poker closed to Americans, and then... Uh, that was sad for me. Come to the World Series from Sweden. Hope to meet me. Well, I will be there towards the end. Let's see. You're there for the entire month of June. You're properly bankroll, playing 50-50 tournaments in cash. I would ask, why are you playing 50-50 tournaments in cash? Hyper-focused on playing your A game. That means you should play fewer games 
You can't play poker all the time and be on your A game all the time. Um, again, like, like right here, it seems like you want to play a lot, yet you want to play your A game all the time, and that's just not going to be possible. You need off days or off, time off. I'll tell you, I mean, I, I've played the series many years where I would play tournaments at noon or 11 a.m. now, and then if I busted before about 7 or 8 p.m., I'd go play cash games until about midnight. Wake up, do it again. Or eat cash games or the sit and go, so they have it at the Rio, which are super soft, by the way. And... I don't think I played my A game the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I made some money most most summers, but I was tired, I was burnt out, I didn't want to be playing anymore. But apparently my B game is fine enough to win against most people. But I don't think that's ideal for most people, especially if it's your first time, because for all you know, you may go off the deep end trying to grind all the time and you may go nuts. Just be careful. Bill Galfon's new sites gives rake back to players by splashing money into pots. Well, they do that in live um, casinos. They have these, it's like a, I don't know what they call it, a rack pot or something, where they basically put $100 in random pots every once in a while. Uh, definitely changes things. I, don't, I haven't really looked into his site much. I don't think it's open to Americans at the moment, and therefore I'm not so worried about it. You all have to realize, if something is just completely irrelevant to me, it's not on my radar. Someone asked me earlier, am I watching the Aussie main events? Aussie million main event. Like, no, I don't have time for this, right? Believe it or not, I don't have time to sit in my computer for eight hours watching poker all day. Uh, I have a family. I have a training site to run for all of you, etc., etc. And I don't have time to check out someone's site if I'm not even going to be playing on it. I don't have time to watch a stream on the other side of the world. I have nothing against any of these people. I think everything they're doing is great. But time is limited. Time is by far your most limited resource. So find things that are very specific and applicable to you and um, do that, right? That said, you should always branch out. You should always try to see what other people are doing. But at the same time, like imagine I found short deck no limit hold'em fun, but I would never ever play the game because it doesn't exist where I live and I'm not going to go anywhere to play it. Doesn't make sense for me to spend a lot of time watching that stream if I have other things to do. And the answer is just absolutely no, right? Which is why I haven't. It's called a rack attack. There you go. You all know what I'm talking about. You think it's plus of me to tell all of you fish where you like to play in Vegas. Probably. I'm not so worried about that, though. I mean, I very quickly realized over the last few years, my goal in Vegas is not to make the most money possible. My goal in Vegas is to play World Series of Poker events, try to win some bracelets. But also, that's not even the goal, because clearly I'm only going to play like eight or ten bracelet events, right? If that was the goal, I'd play the whole time. The goal is to make good connections, have a good time, play well when I'm playing, enjoy myself. That doesn't mean like going out and partying. That means staying sane and not being pissy that I'm at the poker table the whole time. And um, that's where we are in life. The goal for life right now for me is not to maximize dollars per hour, which if I told myself that 10 years ago, I'd say you're absolutely crazy uh, because I would just sit there and play all day every day. If you all want a good tip, best way to make money in the World Series of Poker if you have a small bankroll, play the sit and goes at the World Series of Poker. They have 10 person tournaments. Go there, try to find the biggest, most aggressive looking bad player. Not biggest, I mean, you know, most, most flashy looking player. Say, hey, do you want to last longer? Heads up, me and you. And he'll say yes, like 90% of the time because he has an ego problem. Say it's a $200 sit and goes, so let's do $1,000 last longer. Make sure you get to hold the money because they may try to welch on you. And um, then win that last longer bet 65% of the time. I did that in $1,000 tournaments for 5K and 10K over and over and over again. Printed money, won something like 150K playing these things. It was great. There you go. Free money. That is what you should do if you want to make a lot of money at the World Series of Poker with almost no variance. But you're not going to win any World Series bracelets. <laughs> What are the best tournaments to play if you're limited on time? I'll tell you all, all what I'm doing. I'm going for the World Poker Tour Tournament of Champions, which is the... Unfortunately, it's like the same time as the 50K, so I have to skip the 50K. So that's a bummer. I'm playing an Aria WPT. Actually, let me get out my schedule. I have my schedule. Where is my schedule? Give me just a second. I will load it up. All right, let's see. We're playing Aria on May 27th. They have a 10K. Then we're playing a Turbo Bounty Tournament, the World Series of Poker, on the 29th. Then we're playing the World Poker Tour Tournament of Champions on June 1st. Then we're going to play a 5K 
World Series Poker event on June 3rd. So what I'm doing at the beginning, then I'm leaving. Then I'm coming back on June 1st for a 5K, then the main event on the 3rd, then there's a bunch of tournaments afterwards. I'll stay till, I don't know, 18th or so. That's the plan. That's the schedule. You play online. I've played online a ton. What do I think about it? I think it's great. Great way to get good at poker. You want a lot at a young age that I invest. I have uh, three houses and um, a decent retirement fund. So yes. I also blew a lot of money too. <laughs> I have a video about how to not blow your money with Mike Sexton. Find that on YouTube. Um, YouTube.com slash float the turn. Or just search Jonathan Little Mike Sexton. Only watch once you want a million dollars or something like that. Do you get paid for commentary? Sometimes. Anyway, um, Anthony, the, your question again is not very precise, right? Because it depends a lot on your bankroll. If you have infinite money, you should just play all the super high roller stuff, right? So go find that. And that's going to be at the very beginning and at the very end. Which book has the most on heads up play? Find a heads up book. There's a chapter in Excelling at No Limit Hold on Heads Up by Olivier Bousquet, who's a very, very great player. Is Alex Fitzgerald going to the World Series? I don't know. Ask him. Well, Mark, come find me. I just told you where I'm going to be literally every day. So good, good, good. All right, what else do we want to talk about? If you all enjoyed the beginning of this stream discussing how to play very, very passive players, let me know. We can do how to play against maniacs, how to play against aggressive players. How to play against players who consistently check raise the flop, players who lead the flop a lot, players who do blank, do blank, do blank. If you like that, let me know. If you thought it was boring, let me know, and I'll never do it again. Sometimes a good rep will raise your flop bets on dry boards. You call them down with marginal holdings, and they have a bluff. Yeah, sure. Will there be shot clocks at the World Series of Poker No Limit Hold'em events? I know in the high roller they did it last year, and I thought it was great. Um... So I don't know. The problem with shot clocks for a very big tournament is you have to have a lot of clocks. <laughs> and currently, a lot of these places use iPads, and iPads are relatively expensive. So I don't think they're using it in, them in most tournaments, or mostly whenever you get in the money. Louis Philippe said he liked it. Clinton said he liked it. Good. How about how to play against super geniuses like you? I have an article about that um, on JonathanLittlePoker.com in my blog. I think it's something like how to play against world-class opponents or something like that. Your thoughts on being staked? Do you play cash in Vegas much? Um, I used to play a ton. I haven't played in a while. We just discussed this. Um, what are my thoughts on being staked? I think if you are properly bankrolled, there's no reason for you to be staked. So why would you not be properly bankrolled? Well, number one, you're not very good, right? So in that case, you should not get staked. No one should stake you because you're bad. Um, unless you're selling at a discount, you probably don't want to sell at a discount. Number two, you're playing games that where the buy-in progresses exponentially. This happens to a lot of high-stakes players, where let's say you're bankrolled to play 5K tournaments. You have 500K to your name or a million dollars to your name. But there are 25Ks and 50Ks and 100Ks that are the exact same field, if not a little softer because there are fewer marginal regs. Should you be selling action in those games? The answer is almost certainly yes, because you possess the skill to beat those games, but you don't have the bankroll. Usually people have to sell action because they're not very good. Or because they are playing higher than they should. That said, there are times to sell action, especially if you are trying to decrease variance. Imagine you actually are very skilled and you don't mind selling some action at, in a main event, like at Borgata, let's say, there's 3,500. Maybe you sell action for it at 1.3. Pretty good markup, right? Let's say you think your ROI is 50%. Well, that means you get 30% off the top and you give the investor 20% potential return, right, in exchange for accepting some variance. And in that scenario, you may sell 50% of yourself, which results in you having, how much is 50% times 1.3? Uh, you sell 60, you basically, um, you sell 50% of yourself, but you get to keep half of your action for 35% of the buy-in. And would you like to have half your action for 35% of the buy-in? Quite often, a lot of players would. So that's the time that, where it may make sense. Most people who ask this question, though, are asking it with the idea of, I have literally no money, or almost no money. I want to play bigger. I want to play more prestigious events. And that's not ideal. Like, if you're a 2-5 player, 
Why would you sell action to play 510 in a game that's just tougher? Just play 2-5 with all of your money. You don't have to deal with any backers or whatnot. And then you are playing in a softer game. So you play for a softer game with all of your action as opposed to a bigger game with less of your action. A harder game with more of your action. It doesn't make sense. Um, that said, there is one more time that definitely makes sense to get staked. That is when you get coached by the backer. Um, I'm part of a poker backing site, pokar.com, P-O-C-A-R-R.com. And they back players from very small stakes all the way up to very high stakes. And the goal is essentially to train players to go from playing like $5, $10 average buying games to $500 buying games. And that takes time, but they have had tons and tons of successes. Um, one of their main guys, Rob Tinian, won the Sunday Million twice. He started off as a back E, playing tiny stakes, won it twice. Uh, Michael Acevedo, who's writing the Game Theory book, Modern Poker Theory, that's coming out soon. I'm helping him with editing. He started off as a $10 player there. Now he's winning W coups and stuff left and right. And then it definitely makes sense to get backing because you're ch exchanging potential earnings for world-class coaching, presumably. And then it's almost like you're just paying for coaching, and that's definitely fine. Why is there more variance in tournaments? Because you cash in tournaments way less often than you cash in cash, right? In cash games, you win half of your sessions, give or take. In tournaments, you win 10% of your sessions, give or take, right? That adds to variance. <sighs> What's my personal growth challenge? I get my kids where they're 18 years old and I can go back to regular life. What do I do when I first sit down? Just try to play well? <laughs> That's pretty much it. You're all for keeping it real, but hot damn. I'm not sure what that means. What was that site? Pokar.com. Let me see. I'm going to try to type it here, see if it works. P-O-C-A-R.com. There's a chance that worked. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. All right, let's see. People playing bigger games aren't a whole lot better. Depends on the stakes you're moving from. You're going to find if you're moving from like 1-2 to 2-5, yeah, the games are pretty much the same. 2-5 to 5-10, maybe a little tougher. 5-10 to 10-20, much tougher. 10-20, 25-50, a whole lot tougher. From there, you need a game select really, really well. If you play in soft games, it could be really great. If you play in tough games, it could be nearly impossible. Um, what kind of resume do you need to get on that site? Do they need a graph or a poker tracker, etc.? They're going to look up your results on sites that you cannot possibly rig, right? So they're going to look you up on the public databases because clearly you could rig your own hold a manager, provide them some BS graph. They do a lot of vetting of players. They accept 5 or 10% of people who apply who have reasonable resumes. If you have no resume, then obviously you're just not going to get accepted. They want winning players who are beating small stakes. They aren't trying to take a terrible player and turn them into a winner. They're trying to take... Someone who clearly has potential, who can figure stuff out on their own, who is willing to work, but wants the fast track to success. Do you hate your opponents at the table? No, I don't hate anyone. I don't, I don't need to play emotionally charged poker. Some people do to care that much. I just try to play my best all the time. And I realize I'm, I'm playing a game against myself. I'm not playing a game against my opponents. My opponents are there and they are relevant, but I'm not trying to necessarily ruin their lives or anything like that. I'm trying to make the best decisions I can based on the strategies I think that they are using. It's a math game at the end of the day in my mind. Can I share a detailed review of Poker Snowy for newbies? I'm on. Go there. I have lots of videos on this on YouTube. Go watch my videos. Google Jonathan Little Poker Snowy. You will see me playing around with it on the, um, like the quiz feature or the challenge feature, whatever they call it. And I think it's great. It's a great way to get practice in. How does it work when someone wants to stop getting staked? Very often, uh, they will give a makeup deal right makeup deals are where if you are down let's say let's say we play a tournament we're gonna let you play ten dollar average buy-in tournaments let's say you get down a thousand bucks because you lose a bunch of tournaments now you have to cash for a thousand dollars before you get any money back if you cash for a thousand everyone's even poker gets their money back you can quit if you cash for ten thousand you're up nine thousand right you can chop that money however your ratio is let's just say you get fifty percent so you get forty five hundred poker gets forty five hundred Balance gets cleared back to zero. You can quit. Basically, you can quit when you're up or when they cut you. The secret to running a big poker stable, in my mind, is cutting people quickly. You will figure out very quickly if people are good or bad. So they end up cutting a lot of people. Um, if you are playing $10 tournaments and you get down $1,000 really fast, obviously you're terrible. So you're out. They're just going to take their $1,000 loss and realize you were probably not worth it and you were bad investments. And that's okay. But... 
that's why they do a lot of vetting first. As you vet your players harder and harder and you try to get people who are very motivated, they will be way more inclined to work hard for you. And you can do other things to motivate them. I'm not going to go into all the ways to motivate them. Um, a lot of them I didn't even think of. So people at Pokar are smart. They figure out ways to motivate players I wouldn't even think of. We're not going to give away all their secrets here. <laughs> that is not my role. But anyway, you get to quit when you're up. I imagine if you're down and you want to buy out in some way, they probably let you buy out too. So I don't exactly know. <sighs> all right. My wife just sent me a text message. Her food will be arriving soon, so I have to go get it from the front door. So that means I have to go soon. Pretty much now. I uh, hope you all had a great day today. Or have we all have a great day today. My day is like halfway over because I woke up um, at 5 a.m. What, that's five hours ago? Oh my gosh, it's time for a nap. If you're part of the Inner Circle, you can find that at pokercoaching.com slash inner circle. I will see you in the webinar at 2 p.m. Make sure you send in your questions. We already had a lot of, already had a lot of great questions sent in, so that's going to be fun. What else? The weekend's here. Weekends are always fun. My weekends are spent babysitting James. We've been going to the museums recently. That's been a lot of fun. I share that on Instagram with people in my story, so if you care about that at all, check it out. D. Nelson wants the Rams to win. All right. As far as I know, all of the public is betting on the Patriots. So you know what that means. You supplemented your lifestyle plan one, two, when you move. Now your wife wants you to continue supplementing. <laughs> Good job. Thanks for another high-quality session. Thanks for the ideas, Louis Philippe. I appreciate it. All right. Have a good day. Enjoy yourselves. Be nice. Have fun. You know what I say every time. Free sports bet on the Super Bowl on Poker Stars. I don't know anything about that, but if they're giving away free money, you might as well go collect your free money. All right. Be nice to someone. Enjoy yourselves. Good luck in your games. Play smart in your games. Don't go on tilt.